please welcome to the stage, Ken Gowers! Chicago, what's up? Make some noise out there. How are we? They told me I can do this anywhere. They told me I can do this in, in London or New York or Los Angeles. I said, after the last two years that we've had, I'm fucking coming home. I'm coming home. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Thank you, bro. I left Chicago eight years ago to pr pursue stand-up comedy, and uh, what a journey it's been. I mean, it's been incredible. I've been all over the world. I've been to the middle of Iraq, everybody, to entertain our troops. Yes, thank you so much, thank you, thank you. Am I an American hero? Fuck yeah. Because they didn't tell me where I was going. They just called me up like, you wanna go entertain the troops? They're like, of course, I'd be honored. They're like, all right, pack your bag, grab your passport, and then get on this plane. And I was on that plane for 19 hours. And I was like, where the fuck are we going? I mean, we, we got bases all over. I was like, oh, are we going to the Philippines? Are we going to Guam? <gasps> are we going to Hawaii? And then we just landed in the middle of a war. I'm not kidding. I had a flak jacket, a helmet, and 14 dick jokes. That is it. <laughs> now, whenever you're landing in the middle of a war zone, they do something called a tactical landing. Yeah. This is when you're in the middle of an airplane and all of a sudden, they do a nosedive and plummet toward the earth at 500 miles per hour. And it's not a commercial plane. They don't get on the intercom and be like, ladies and gentlemen, we've begun our descent into hell. Go ahead and put your tray tables up and your seats in their upright position. There are no seats on a military plane. I was sitting on a bucket, falling toward the earth at 500 miles an hour, whilst shitting my pants. <laughs> and at the last minute, the very last minute, this dude pulls up and he lands in the middle of nowhere. No airport, no control tower, just sand and snakes and a fuck ton of scorpions. <laughs> and the back of the plane opens up and a Marine jumps on board and he is made of guns. He's all guns. <laughs> And he screams, scab your gear and get the fuck off the plane! And I go, please don't yell at me, I have just shit my pants! <laughs> and they put us on a little bus and it's one in the morning and all the windows are blacked out. And even that little light in the ceiling has tape over it. And finally I go, excuse me, sir, why did you put tape on the light? And he looks at me, he goes, snipers. <laughs> and that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> oh, snipers? Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Get in the tent, there's a map of Iraq on the wall, and I raise my hand, I go, excuse me, sir? I go, where are we? He goes, we're 50 miles from the Syrian border, and I go, there's been a terrible mistake. <laughs> and I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> and then I heard the loudest explosion I've ever heard in my entire life, and I go, what was that? He goes, everything's fine. I go, it's not fine. <laughs> he goes, we're just firing artillery at ISIS. I'm like, they're fucking here? <laughs> ISIS is here. ISIS está aquí. And then my cell phone started ringing because apparently T-Mobile only works in the middle of Iraq. <laughs> really, you piece of shit phone? Four bars, crystal clear calls. I'm streaming Hulu. I pick up the phone, it's my brother. My brother is three and a half years older than me. He's been a bully my whole life. So I'm like, you know what? I'm finally gonna impress my brother. I answer the phone, he goes, hey, dickhead. That's his nickname for me. He goes, where are you at? I go, you ain't gonna believe this shit. 
I go, I'm in Iraq. I go, we're entertaining the troops. And I go, we're 50 miles from the Syrian border. I go, what do you think about that? He goes, hey, he goes, if you get captured by ISIS and they put you in a cage, don't cry like a little bitch. <laughs> of all the times in your life you can cry like a little bitch, that's number one. You know the number of tragic events that have to happen in this scenario? My plane gets shot down. I survive. ISIS shows up to the crash site. There's a huge gunfight. I have no fucking gun. I give up immediately. And then they put me in a cage and I'm just sitting there going like, well, I can't cry like a little bitch. And then after a week, ISIS is like, he is very brave. I mean, he has not cried one time. Would you like to be in ISIS or would you like to die? I'm like, fuck, I don't, I guess I'll be in ISIS. All my buddies from high school, did you hear Ken Garz in ISIS? What? The guy from Drama Club, that guy's in ISIS? Weird. I left Iraq, I went to Djibouti, Africa. If you're not familiar with Djibouti, it is next to Jabal's. Okay. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> I just giggle every time. Djibouti is in Northern Africa, it's right next to Ethiopia. I got off the plane at three in the morning and the current temperature in Djibouti was 419 degrees. And the humidity, all of it. It was all in Djibouti. A thousand percent humidity. I asked my tour guide, I was like, tell me about Djibouti. I go, what do I gotta know? He goes, Ken, everything's fine. He goes, just look out for the mosquitoes because some of them have malaria. <laughs> what? He goes, you got your shot? I'm gonna go, bro, nobody gave me a shot. Looks me up and down, goes, you should be fine. I go, what are the symptoms of malaria? He goes, you're gonna sweat profusely and shit your brains out. I go, well, I have malaria already. I got it at a Taco Bell in Qatar. Fast forward a couple of years, the pandemic hits. I go and stay with my folks, make sure they got fucking toilet paper or whatever, that was a thing. I stay with them for two weeks, and that is too long to stay with people in their 70s. Because you start learning shit about them, you don't want to know. One day, I'm using my father's bathroom, I open up his drawer, and I discovered his Viagra. Do you know how embarrassing it is? Stealing your father's Viagra. <laughs> That shit's amazing. <laughs> My father is 78 years old and he's starting to do old man shit. He always has the latest iPhone, but he doesn't know how to use it. He started using the voice to text feature recently. Drives me nuts. I get the weirdest text messages from him. He picked me up in the airport two days ago. This is the text I got. Hey, Ken, we're pulling up. I see the car, Marilyn. And then he hits send. <laughs> He's just yelling at my mom. <laughs> my dad's a very quiet person, very stoic. Right? I don't talk, he never calls me. I always have to call my mom and say, here, talk to your father. So a couple of weeks ago, he left me a three minute voicemail. It freaked me out. I go, oh, shit, does he have COVID? Is he having a heart attack? What is going on? All of a sudden I hit play, it was just, I see the car, Marilyn. <laughs> Just a Barry Garbutt dial. That's all it was. I'm hanging on to that bad boy. 
That's his legacy right there. I'm gonna play it at his funeral. I go, I think my father put it best when he said, Quit giving Ken money! <laughs> my father bought a gun for the first time in his life. I'm not pro-gun or anti-gun. I don't give a shit. Do whatever you want. But he's 78 and he should not own a firearm. My father falls asleep at red lights. He doesn't doze off for a second. People got a knock on the window. <laughs> Sir, it's, yeah. I go, where'd you get a gun? Go, I gotta protect my home. The world's gone crazy. I go, you live in a gated community in the suburbs of Chicago. No one's coming for your Tom Clancy novels. No one's trying to hack into your Yahoo email. I said, plus you're deaf. My father was a firefighter for 35 years. He can't hear shit anymore. <laughs> you guys are passionate about hearing loss? I appreciate that, yeah. You should, yeah, that's great. I said, you're not gonna hear him come in. This burglar can set up a drum kit in your bedroom and play a Led Zeppelin solo and you're not gonna move a muscle. The only way you're gonna wake up is if this dude steps on the hose of your CPAP machine and you can't breathe and <laughs> What is the meaning of this? I said, where you got the gun? He said, I got, a, I got it in a lock box under the bed. Oh, perfect. Oh, that's great. So not only are you not gonna hear the guy come in, on the off chance that you do, you're gonna leap out of bed on your recently replaced knee. You're gonna kneel down, get the box, put it on the bed, and then open the combination in the dark with no glasses. I go, where are your glasses, by the way? He turns so red, he goes, in the kitchen. I go, oh, you mean with the fucking burglar? I was gonna buy a gun myself. I was. Things got crazy out in Los Angeles and I thought about it. But then I went to the gun store and in the back of the store they have a shooting range. And I started blasting these paper targets from 50 feet, 20 feet, and 10 feet away. And here's what I found out that day. If you come and rob my house and you get within two feet of me, you're dead. <laughs> Beyond that, you're gonna be fine. I might as well throw the gun at you. It was awful. <laughs> I'm proud of my parents. They got their vaccine. And look, I'm not making a political statement. Get it, don't get it, whatever. I don't give a shit anymore. Not everyone in my family got their vaccine. I got an aunt who lives down in Florida, and she is fully immersed in QAnon. <laughs> fully. A Q tattoo on her face and everything. And I called her up. I said, Aunt Patty, I heard you're not going to get the vaccine. She goes, I heard it's going to change your DNA. I go, what? She goes, yeah, I read it on the Facebook. First of all, if you refer to it as the Facebook, you are pig shit crazy. <laughs> Out of your mind. She goes, I read an article on the Facebook. It's going to change your DNA. I said, Aunt Patty, I am a fat, bald alcoholic with scoliosis. Please change my fucking DNA. <laughs> you can change all of it. I hope I wake up tomorrow with a big dick and wings like, thank you, Moderna! <laughs> I'm a dragon! <laughs> Why are we assuming the side effects are bad? What if they're awesome? What if you wake up tomorrow and you are a big dick dragon? No one's complaining. You get Pfizer, you can be invisible with laser beams coming out of your eyes. You get Johnson & Johnson and it works.
I'm not going back on lockdown. I'm not doing it. I feel like everybody was productive during lockdown except me. My friend wrote a book. He's a published author. Another friend of mine, she lost 40 pounds. She looks amazing. I watched television for 14 months straight. Morning, noon, and night. Tele I watched every documentary on Netflix. That pandemic was so long, I feel like Tiger King should be out of jail already. Doesn't that feel like 10 years ago that Tiger King came out? And there's not a single person in this room that would have watched Tiger King if there wasn't a pandemic. Oh, oh, a gay zookeeper from Oklahoma? No thanks. Pandemic hits, you're like, this is the greatest television show in the history of television. I watched it four times. I watched them all, every documentary. I watched that Epstein documentary. Who watched that piece of shit? It was disgusting, wasn't it? Oh my God, who fucks chicks from Florida? Oh God. Gross. Oh, they're always wearing jean skirts and white flip-flops. No thank you. Disgusting. <laughs> I watched a documentary on the Golden State Killer. This guy was pure evil. Murdered 13 people. He assaulted 50 women, and it took him 45 years to catch this guy. And the only reason that they caught him was because one of his distant relatives took a 23andMe test. That's how they caught him. Can you imagine being this relative? This guy just spit in a tube. He's like, I wonder if I'm Irish. Like, it turns out you're 4% rapist. Like, I gotta get that part removed. I'm gonna get a vaccine and change my DNA. They interviewed these women, man. They interviewed the survivors of this guy's attacks. And they asked them all the same question. Is there anything that you remember about the night that you were attacked? And every single one of those women looked right in the camera and said, the one thing I remember about him was that he had a tiny penis. I was like, fuck yeah! Yes! Get the last word in, ladies! Quit giving these guys cool nicknames. The Green River Killer, BTK, the Night Stalker. Call him the Tiny Dick Rapist. He'll stop doing that shit. <laughs> this guy's thumbing through the paper. I wonder what they said about me. Tiny Dick Rapist strikes again. I'm gonna become a plumber. This is bullshit. <laughs> My favorite show, by the way, my favorite show, hands down, is a television show called Love on the Spectrum. Who's seen it? By Barnaby. Yes. Beautiful. It's an amazing show. Love on the Spectrum is about adults with autism that are looking for love, and it is the most beautiful, wholesome television show I've ever seen. And my theory is this, is if we all dated like autistic adults, there would be no divorce in this world. Let me explain what an autistic date looks like. First of all, they are dressed to the nines. He's wearing a three-piece suit. She has a beautiful sundress on. He shows up with flowers and sits down and says, you look very beautiful tonight. And she goes, you look very handsome. And then he goes, oh, I love dinosaurs. And she goes, I don't love dinosaurs. And he goes, goodbye, and fucking leaves. That was it, that was the end of the date. There was like, maybe I can learn to love dinosaurs. He was like, you don't like dinosaurs? Fuck you, I'm gone. Bye. We complicate dating, don't we? We complicate it. I was on those dating apps for years, putting up 10 year old pictures designing a little profile. By the way, ladies, all your profiles are the same. I'm just looking for a guy with a great sense of humor. Oh, really? Because I'm literally one of the funniest people in the world. <laughs> 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 
And I know you're thinking, that's pretty arrogant. Bill at work is funny. Bring him here. I'll fucking destroy him. <laughs> Just be honest. You're not looking for a guy with a great sense of humor. You're looking for a guy with abs. <laughs> Dating is a young man's game. It is. It's for people in their 20s. I was dating well into my 40s, and at one point my pickup line was, so do you wanna? That was my pickup line. Because if not, I'm gonna go home and make a hot pocket and put a heating pad on my back. I'm 40, my back hurts. I don't give a shit if you come home with me. I have a PlayStation and I get to be in the Super Bowl tomorrow. Because the older you get, the harder it gets. You guys in your 20s, which by the looks of it, is nobody in here. <laughs> you got it easy in your 20s. You go home with a girl, you're like, hey, you got condoms back in your house? I was 40, I was like, do you have Tums? Because daddy had pizza for dinner and that shit's coming back. Especially if we're gonna lie down for four minutes. Sometimes you get desperate when you're dating. It happens to everybody. At one point, I couldn't get a date to save my life. So I did something stupid. I went out and bought a Mustang GT. I was like, this is really going to impress the ladies. It impressed three 14-year-old boys. They're like, nice car, mister. I'm like, thanks a lot. I got some candy. Let's go for a ride. It's too far. It's too far. Here's the thing about owning a sports car, and you fellas out there know what I'm talking about. Every single day, somebody wants to race you, right? Every day. I'm driving down the highway one day, I look at my rearview mirror, and a Dodge Charger's trying to catch up to me. I'm like, I'm not losing to a Charger. This is a Mustang. Floor that son of a bitch. I'm doing 105 miles an hour. I look back at my rearview mirror, he caught up. Little fun fact about Chargers in California, yeah, they're state troopers. <laughs> He pulls me over, he's like, you want to tell me why you were speeding? I go, bro, I wasn't speeding, I was winning, and you know it! <laughs> Let's finish this. I'm married now, though, I don't have to worry about dating anymore. No more dating for this guy. No more dating crazy people. Because I live in Los Angeles, and they're out of their fucking minds. I went on a date one time with a woman who kept her eyes shut the entire time she talked. You ever meet one of these people before? This is what it looked like. I did my undergrad at UCLA. I'm like, are you a fucking Muppet? What are you doing? I kept waiting for halfway through the conversation for her to just open one eye and be like, winter is coming. Like, holy shit. I dated a millionaire for a while. I have no idea how I pulled that off. Found out very quickly I was not wearing the pants in that relationship. She calls me up one night. She's like, get over here, I wanna fool around. I'm like, you know what, I had a few beers, I can't drive. She goes, I'm gonna send you an Escalade. I was like, no shit. I'm like, I got Cadillac dick, hell yeah. I'm in the back of that Escalade. I realize you gotta bring your A game every time you have sex with a millionaire. You can't take a night off because there might be cash and prizes involved. <laughs> like she has an amazing orgasm. She's like, guess who just got their college paid off? You did, like, fuck you! <laughs> I just want a scholarship. <laughs> My wife and I are boring, man. We just do puzzles all the time. We do. That was a big thing in the pandemic, wasn't it? Puzzles. And that was the real hero in the pandemic. Our doctors, our nurses, absolutely, they are our heroes. Absolutely, give them a round of applause, yes. But the real hero was the guy working at the puzzle factory. Think about it, this guy was coasting through life. He's making like five, six puzzles a week tops. And then on March 13, 2020, he showed up to work and they're like, Jose, you're not gonna believe this shit. 
but we need 432,000 puzzles. And Jose was like, excuse me? I don't think we had that many pictures. And I quit. <laughs> we played a lot of board games during the pandemic as well, man. They were all sold out. You couldn't find them. Finally, we found Monopoly on Amazon. We ordered it, had it delivered the next day, opened it up. We bought the wrong Monopoly. We bought Millennial Monopoly. It's a real game, Millennial Monopoly. I opened it up, everything's different. The little dog is a rescue dog. The little car is electric. Marvin Gardens is just a weed clinic. Chance cards are called triggered. Free parking is called something like a safe space. And the banker is just your parents. <laughs> My perspective changed during the pandemic though. It changed. I'm grateful every single day. Like even having dinner with a friend is a special event. I had dinner with my friend Becky a couple of weeks ago and she was very quiet during dinner. So finally I was like, Becky, why are you so quiet? We haven't seen each other in like 18 months. And she goes, this is embarrassing. She goes, but after dinner, I gotta go to CVS and buy a plan B pill. I was like, oh shit. She goes, yeah, I had a one night stand last night and the condom broke. I just wanna make sure that everything's okay. I'm like, well, I'm coming with you on this journey. I learned a lot that day about plan B. Did you guys know that there's two types of plan B? There's plan B and there's a generic brand called option two. And it's only $10 cheaper. And she's like, I think I'm gonna go with option two. And I was like, Becky, this might be a name brand situation. Like, let's spend the money, sweetheart. And then I realized I'm not the father of this child. I'm not having sex with Becky. And she is my friend and I'm a good friend, so I'm gonna fuck with her. I started to walk about five feet behind her down the aisle going, why can't we keep it? I love you. We got to the cashier, the cashier's like, you want a bag for 10 cents? I'm like, I want my son! His name's gonna be Matthew? She goes, stop it! She goes, you're not even the father. I was like, Found out a lot about our friends and family during the pandemic, didn't we? A lot of unfriending done on Facebook. I had lunch with a buddy of mine from high school. I hadn't seen him in 25 years. I found out during the course of our lunch that he was homophobic. I was like, bro, it's 2022. Who gives a shit? Right? Gay guys smell good. They dress awesome. And their parades are dope as fuck. I had two choices. I could either stop being friends with this narrow-minded person or I could change his heart, his mind, and his soul. So I did what any good friend would do. I took my homophobic friend to a gay bar. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. If you've never done it, do it as soon as possible. Because it takes a homophobic dude about six minutes to realize that he's at a gay bar. He's just on the dance floor having a good time. Then all of a sudden, his face just went. <laughs> and he looks at me, he goes, are we at a gay bar? I was like, fuck yeah, we are. <laughs> he starts flexing right away. Poor decision, right? <laughs> like the last place you want to flex, a gay bar. <laughs> he gets quiet and he goes, he goes, hey man. He goes, any of these queers hitting me, I'm gonna beat their ass. I go, first of all, I don't think anybody uses that word in a derogatory way anymore. 
I think the only person using it in a derogatory way is some old man sitting in a retirement home in Alabama, and he's usually talking about tater tots. Like, these are queer. I just shit my pants. <laughs> Second of all, I'm not sure if you have noticed, but there are two men in this gay bar that don't work out at least four hours a day, and it's me and you. So if you think I'm going to back you up in a weird gay bar fight, fuck you. <laughs> he goes, bro, we've been friends for 30 years. You don't have my back? I go, let me put it to you this way. The last thing that you hear before one of these dudes knocks you out is going to be your friend standing on the dance floor going, someone kick this guy's ass. <laughs> Who brought this asshole? Get his wallet! <laughs> now, gra grab his wallet! <laughs> I know a thing or two about being gay because my wife is so hot, everyone thinks that I'm her gay best friend. <laughs> oh my God. She is gorgeous. I'm not kidding. We walk down the street and men are like, ma'am, is he bothering you? I'm like, I'm her husband. I have a wonderful sense of humor. <laughs> Guys flirt with her. I fucking love it. I love it. I'm not an insecure man. I don't get jealous. I take it as a compliment. I went to the bathroom one time, I came back, some dude was laying it on thick, bought her a drink or everything. I put it on Instagram, like, look at this bitch right here. <laughs> I was like, hell yeah. I finally bailed her out, I walked up, I stuck my gut out, I was like, hey, I'm her husband. He was like, fuck! <laughs> he looks me up and down, goes, how'd you pull that off? I was like, a big dick and good credit. I got news for you fellas, it's 2022 and women don't need us for shit anymore. They got their own money, their own job, their own car. All they need is a big dick and good credit. If you're with a guy right now, he doesn't have a big dick and good credit, call him an Uber because we know you took your car to get here tonight. <laughs> oh yeah, what was I talking about? My wife is hot, yeah, that's it. <laughs> My wife and I were friends for six years before we started dating. That's right, I did it. Friend zone to end zone, don't give up hope. <laughs> I played the long game. I just sat in the bushes waiting. It's weird when you first start dating your friend. We were best friends for six years. We weren't ever romantic ever before. Then all of a sudden, I had my opportunity. I took it. Now, the first time we were intimate, it was weird, not going to lie. We're going to see each other naked for the first time. For me, it's going to be awesome. For her, fucking not so awesome. <laughs> right? I, I look like that towel on the beach that all the purses and shoes are under. Like, fucking... <laughs> So I got us a hotel room the first time. Let me explain, she was getting divorced, she's staying with her folks, I was visiting Chicago, I'm staying with my folks, and we didn't wanna make love in the basement like a couple of high schoolers. <laughs> now, I don't know if you guys have ever gotten a hotel room just to have sex before, but it's not like it is in the movies. In the movies, it's like, you wanna get a room? All of a sudden, it cuts to clothes coming off. In real life, you gotta check into that shit. And it is a long process. <laughs> you gotta have a driver's license, a credit card, a confirmation number. I had to go look at the license plate number of my dad's Buick. <laughs> this guy's explaining breakfast the next day. He's like, we have a wonderful continental breakfast. 
from six to nine. I go, bro, I've been waiting six years to have sex with this girl. Please give me the key. <laughs> He's like, do you want a warm cookie? I'm like, of course I want a warm cookie. Yes, give me the cookie. This is my second marriage. I was married about 10 years ago for about two years. And I'll be honest with you, I did not want to get divorced, but my wife's boyfriend, Todd, was insistent. He's <laughs> a good dude, very aggressive. People ask me all the time, why'd you get divorced? There's never one reason you get divorced. It's a complicated situation. But I can tell you folks, the beginning of the end of my marriage was when we went on a couple's diet. If you're on a couple's diet right now, I implore you, get off that shit. <laughs> it is a no-win situation. I'm a guy, which means I can lose like nine pounds in four days by just not thinking about butter. Meanwhile, it took my ex-wife about six months to lose about a pound and a half, and now all of a sudden I'm an asshole because I'm losing weight faster than her. I tried to be a good husband. I started cheating on the couple's diet. I was eating McDonald's like every other day, but I'm not an idiot, so I had to hide the McDonald's bag in my neighbor's garbage can, and now he's getting divorced. Listen up, you guys want to lose weight as a couple? Go home tonight and make a sex tape. <laughs> oh, I'm oh, I'm serious. Every time you get hungry, just turn that bad boy on. You won't eat for a fucking week. Those things are disgusting. They're gross. I learned things about my body I didn't want to know. I was like, is that a dent? What is that? Is that rust? I'm like, honey, come look at this mole. It's moving. Why is it blue? My ex-wife and I made a sex tape look like Chewbacca was rustling a body pillow. Yeah, it's not easy referring to myself as a body pillow. She was very hairy. <laughs> Purpose of the joke. We used that MyFitnessPal app when we were trying to lose weight. <laughs> Obviously you've used it. <laughs> I love MyFitnessPal, it's awesome. You log in all your meals throughout the day, tells you how many calories you've had, how many carbs, it's great. Even gives you little reminders throughout the day. They're so adorable. It's like, good morning, Ken. Don't forget to log in your breakfast. I was like, you got my fitness pal. <laughs> Evening rolls around. It's like, hey, Ken, it's supper time. Don't forget to log in your dinner. I'm like, you got it, my fitness pal. <laughs> I went on vacation for a week. I decided I'm not gonna log anything into my fitness pal. After three days, I started getting very passive-aggressive notifications. <laughs> Apparently, these notifications aren't working anymore, so we'll just shut them off. I'm like, are we fighting right now, my fitness pal? <laughs> <laughs> I had some ice cream the other night. I put it in, and, and she was like, I think we just want different things. I'm like, did you just dump me, my fitness pal? My first wife and I fought all the time. I hated it. I don't want to fight. Because she would always ask me questions she already knew the answer to. You know who does that? Cops. Cops do that shit. You ever watch the first 48? It's the same argument you have with your wife. Where were you on Tuesday? Like, you're tracking my iPhone. You know where I am. Cops and wives, man, they have all the evidence they need. They just want the confession. <laughs> My new wife and I, we never fight ever. And look, I'm not naive. I know we're honeymooners and eventually we're gonna fight. 
but everything I know about marriage, I learned from my divorce. Because no man ever gets out of a divorce without knowing exactly what the fuck is wrong with him. Your divorce papers are like a Yelp review. I, I gotta say this, man. I, I lied to my first wife, man. And, I, and, and look, like they weren't big lies. They were like men lies. You know, they're like, they're like, I don't watch porno anymore, that's gross. I don't talk to my ex anymore, she's crazy. And then you get caught because we're dumb. And I used to think that I had to solve my wife's problems, right? Guys do that all the time. You need to tell your sister once and for all. You need to tell your mom that she needs to blah, blah, blah. You tell your boss, you get him on the phone right now, you tell your, like, what do I know? Like, I'm just an alcoholic. I don't know shit. Like, how arrogant of me is it to think that I can solve anyone's problems? Like, it took me a long time to learn that being a good partner is knowing when to just say, sounds good, babe. That's it. it sounds good, babe. I used to think it was about winning the fight. I did, I used to think I had to win every fight. But you wanna know what winning fights got me? A fucking divorce. <laughs> and I'm not getting divorced again. Divorced men are like rescue dogs. We've been out in these streets. <laughs> I've been sleeping under cars. At one point you could see all my ribs. Just take me home with you and feed me. And you can put a chip in my neck if you wanna. And I'll sleep at the foot of the bed. I'm gonna be a good boy. Cause no, there's nobody to call. I'm 44 years old. I can't call my friends after I get dumped. They all are married with two kids. The last time I got dumped, I called him and go, bro, it happened. Stacy broke up with me. He's like, well, I just had a two-year-old shit in the bathtub. I was like, so you're busy then? <laughs> and women, I got news for you, all right? You guys think that we don't go through anything through breakups. You think we just go off and sleep with another girl and move on with our lives. But we feel shit, right men? Yeah. We feel it. You ever get dumped so bad you gotta go sit on a pier for a while? Yeah. Every time I see a dude by himself on Navy Pier, I'm like, it gets better, bro. Don't call her. I've been dumped so many times, I can see it coming. There's certain things that you ladies do right before the breakup. Number one, you start working out. Oh fuck, you guys start training for the next guy like it's a goddamn Olympic sport. I dated this one girl for three years. She never did a sit up, a push up, a pull up. All of a sudden she started doing hot yoga at 5 a.m. with some dude named Javier. And I was like, babe, I'll come with you. We'll do this as a couple. And she was like, this is my journey? I'm like, fuck! <laughs> She's on a journey. She cropped me out of our Facebook profile picture. She didn't change the picture. She literally opened up Facebook and moved that circle over until I wasn't in it anymore. <laughs> One minute there's this happy ball guy loving life. The next minute it was just my right ear. I got Van Gogh out of my own photo. <laughs> and you guys are so good at breakups. Women should do all the breaking up because you're planners. You plan this shit meticulously. No girl ever wakes up and is like, I'm gonna break up that asshole today. <laughs> Fuck no, a 90 day process. <laughs> you collect data. You talk to your mom every day for an hour. You start up a group chat with all of your friends titled, Can I Marry a Comedian Slash Uber Driver? <laughs> By the way, if anybody needs a ride after the show, let me know. <laughs> you guys go through all the emotions before the breakup. 
All five stages of grief. So when the breakup finally happens, there's no more emotions. You guys are indifferent. Getting dumped by a woman is like getting laid off from a company. The conversation is the same. In fact, when my wife split from me, she showed up in a pantsuit. I was like, this can't be good. This isn't gonna end well. She sat me down at the kitchen table and she's like, as you know, our organization's gone through several changes recently. And we no longer need your services. Go ahead and collect your belongings and Javier will walk you. I'm like, the guy from yoga? <laughs> Men are terrible at breakups, aren't we ladies? Oh, we're awful. We don't even tell you we're breaking up with you. We just start dating somebody else. And when you find out, and you always find out, we're like, as you know, our organization's got through several changes recently. And I outsourced your position to Tiffany. That was too real for some of you. That's okay. That's all right. That's too real. I'm grateful to be married, guys. I am. I mean it. And I know some of you guys, oh, this guy's whipped. I'm not unwhipped. I'm not whipped. I'm enlightened. You know what I'm saying? Because I missed it. I am. I'm enlightened. I missed having a best friend. I missed having somebody come home to. But the thing that I missed the most about being married was talking shit about other couples. Oh, my. It is the cornerstone of every good marriage. If you guys came here with another couple tonight, the probability that you're gonna talk about on the way home is 100%. And you love these people, they're your best friends. But no matter how bad your marriage is, it is never as fucked up as Mark and Sarah. And if you're sitting there right now like, we never talk about our friends, guess what? You're Mark and Sarah. And there's no secrets amongst married folks. There's no secrets. My wife comes home and tells me everything about our friends. Shit, I don't even want to know. I guess Mark's having a hard time getting it up in the bedroom. I'm like, fuck! I gotta go golfing with Mark on Sunday. And he's gonna be like, should I use a three wood here? I'm like, use any wood you can, bro. I heard you're having some problems. Here's some of my father's Viagra. <laughs> I want to thank you guys for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. I mean it, man. Thank you so much. And how about Jim Cornelson? How cool was that? Wasn't that awesome? A lot of people ask you like how you got involved in comedy. And I have to be honest with you, like this shit started in my childhood. Like I knew since I was 10 that one day I was gonna be a stand-up comedian because my childhood was weird. I have a brittle bone disease called osteogenesis imperfecta. You guys maybe saw the movie Unbreakable. You may remember Samuel L. Jackson's character? I have the same exact disease. I have broken in my life 35 bones. I have broken my legs and my arms and my fingers and my toes and my heart. <laughs> Stupid. I broke my legs so often that I had to wear leg braces when I was a kid. I wore them for two years. Now, if you were a kid in the 80s and you had anything wrong with you, they didn't let you stay in a normal school. They put you in a handicapped school. That's what we called them back then. They were handicapped schools. And I was like, I'm going to be fine in six months. They're like, nope, here's your helmet. Go over there. So I go to the Jane Neal School for the Handicap. It's right off the Dan Ryan, right here in Chicago. And I walk in, well, I, I fucking, I forest gump in. <laughs> and on the wall, they have a sign up for the Special Olympics. And they, they had all kinds of events. They had track and field, and obviously I wasn't gonna do that. <laughs> but they had bean bags. 
right? We call it cornhole in the Midwest. But you guys know the game, right? Little canvas bag with little beans inside. It turns out I'm a prodigy. I'm an amazing beanbag player. I blew through the qualifying rounds of the Special Olympics and I made it to the actual Special Olympics in Soldier Field in 1988. Yeah. And for the first time in my life, I felt normal. Like I felt like an athlete and I felt just like a regular kid and they have a parade in the beginning and I'm fucking Forrest Gumping along the track. And I got cocky and I underestimated my competition. Here's why. Neither one of my competitors had use of their arms. One guy had no arms and the other kid had like a flipper thing going on. I look at my dad, I go, bet the house we're bringing home the gold. The event starts, I'm going third, and what I failed to realize is that what God takes away in one area of your life, he gives you tenfold in another. The guy with no arms kicks off his shoes and socks, he picks the beanbag up with his big toe. He flips it 20 feet in the air, and it went right in the fucking hole. Dude scores like 30 points, a perfect score. The kid with the flipper hand doesn't use his feet because he's got a built-in catapult system. He lays it on his wrist, he goes, go, go, gadget, wrist, and he flips that mother... <laughs> right in the hole. Scores 28 points. I get nervous, my hand starts sweating. I pick up my first bean bag, I go to throw it, it gets caught in my force cup leg brace. It rips open, there are beans flying everywhere. <laughs> Long story short, I won a bronze medal in the Special Olympics in 1988. It's a true story. I learned two important lessons that day. Number one, don't underestimate kids with special needs. I promise you, there is no one more motivated in this whole world than someone who's been told 10,000 times that they can't do something. And the second lesson I learned that day is if one day you find yourself standing on the bronze medal podium at the Special Olympics and you're cast in the shadow of a gold medal winner who is currently eating the beans out of the bean bag. Become a stand-up comedian. <laughs> because no one's gonna believe this shit, so you might as well get paid to tell it. Good night, Chicago.